All right, hello everybody. Welcome, welcome to me trying to sit through a one-hour video of 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 a Microsoft Word tutorial from 1989. Now, before I begin, those who's spamming in the comment, you're copying off of Mr. Beast. You're copying off of Mr. Beast. I am. I'm gonna try out. I'm gonna feel his pain. By looking at this, I don't know who any, any other YouTuber does it, so if other YouTubers do it, and it's not originally made by him, then I don't know, but Mr. Beast, I'm gonna have to apologize. I'm sorry that such a like such a bad YouTuber is copying off of your amazing thing. Dude, I've seen some, some of your videos, you count to like, a hundred thousand, dude, that's crazy. Like, I sat through, I was like skipping, I was trying to skip to the end, and I just couldn't find the end of how long the video was. So yeah, dude, you are, you are insane, I love your videos. Like you said, uh, guys, let's dive straight into this. This Microsoft Word tutorial, by the way, from, nine, from 1989. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna enjoy this. I'm gonna love this. I am joined by Jay the Husky also. He's gonna be playing games in the background. To Welcome to the Mac Academy tutorial system presented by Florida Marketing International Incorporated. My name is Randy like Smith, and over the next couple of hours, we'll be discussing That's Microsoft so Word. Dude, we'll be going over the basics of that program. I'd like to welcome each of you to this tape, and also to the Mac Academy organization. I'd like also, to spend, not, before we to you, dig right into the program, I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about some of the differences between word processing on the Macintosh computer, word processing perhaps that you're used to on IBMs and IBM compatibles, or some of the earlier programs for the Macintosh. You know, today a lot of people yes, talk just, about word dark, processing and they guy, also talk a lot about desktop camera. publishing. One of the first things that you need to realize is that there is a major difference between word processing and desktop publishing. I know you'll go down to your local Apple dealer or one of your software stores and they'll try and convince you that all you need to buy is one program. For example, if you buy PageMaker, you don't need to buy a word processing program. Or if you buy the all new Word 4.0, then uh, you won't need to go buy a desktop publishing program because it does everything. A lot of people don't understand the difference between the two types of programs. And so I'd like to talk about that just for a moment. I'd also like to talk about word processing and how to get the most out of it, and then we'll dig right into the program. First of all, when it comes to word processing and desktop publishing, a good way, I guess, to understand the difference is an experience that I had. I worked at a newspaper for five years. I used to come in and I'd sit down at one of those old-fashioned royal manual typewriters. And whether I was doing a story or an article or a, an advertisement, I'd sit down at that typewriter and I'd type away. And when I finished, I'd, I'd take that hard copy back to the production department. Now, in those days, someone would sit down at a photo typesetting machine, and they would type out everything that I had laid out on a nice piece of paper. Now, the word processing part, that was the part of okay, sitting there getting the words job. on the paper, kind of the creative part, the I part really where the creative know. juices are flowing. And then the production department, they would take that document and they would lay it out and they would set out columns and they'd put God, lines between the columns and, and they would do headlines. Uh, they would take graphics it's or uh, photos with subheads or sidebars and things. they would make your article or your ad look the way that you wanted it to look. That's kind of the difference between word processing and, and desktop publishing. I was doing the word processing part. They were doing the desktop publishing part. Now, today we have some wonderful electronic desktop publishing programs that take all the, the hard parts and, and all the laborious <laughs> steps that it used to take us to, to, to uh, get our document to look just like we wanted it to look, and they've taken all the work out of that. There are many good ones out there. Uh, PageMaker is one that we use, uh, Ready, Set, Go, Quark Express. All of those That's are excellent. So and the recommendation I'd like to make to you is if you are professionally in the business of doing brochures or yeah. doing uh, reports or doing anything other than just standard eight and a half by 11 documents, I would suggest that you get both a professional word processing program and a desktop publishing program. Sure, we can make Word. And we will be doing that in our advanced tape. We'll show you how to do side-by-side -side columns. And we'll show you how to take a graphic and put it into your document. We'll show you how to wrap copy around that. But it is extremely difficult. It takes a long time. Whereas in a desktop publishing program with the push of one or two buttons, you can do exactly the, you can accomplish the same task. So please understand there is a difference in that you need both. 
When it comes to word processing, word processing, as I mentioned, is, is the function of getting all of your thoughts, your words, copy that perhaps is going to sell or, or make someone interested in your business, getting that all down on paper. And there are a lot of good programs out there. Macintosh did not invent word processing. I almost wish it did, but the first word processor that I ever used was a program called WordStar on an IBM program. And I, I kind of get a kick out of IBM people who, who make the comment that the Macintosh screen is too small. Well, I remember on WordStar, the entire third, the entire top third of my screen was a menu bar. And that menu bar was just to show me all the commands, all the key commands that I had to remember to do simple functions in the word processing program. And so they had a lot of great programs for the IBM and the IBM compatibles, WordStar, WordPerfect. First program that came out for the Macintosh was a little program called McWrite. Many of you may remember that. It came with the machine. And for years, we went a long time without a word processing program because everyone felt, well, they've already got one. The Mac owners, they don't need another one. And then uh, Microsoft came out with Microsoft Word. And they found out that, yes, us Mac owners would go buy another program. Today, we have a myriad of programs. Uh, we have WordPerfect for the Macintosh. We have uh, WordStar is now available for the Macintosh. Full Write Professional right now. There are a lot of excellent programs. Uh, hopefully, you have bought the Word program. That's why you've got it. Uh, I recommend it. It's the one we use. It does everything uh, that we need it to do. So there are a lot of word processing programs out there. Since you're using Word and since you're using the Macintosh, I would recommend that you find out what this program is best at and use that to its fullest capacity or capability. So we're going to be looking at, at the capabilities of Word as, as we go through the program this morning. Uh, another little caution, I guess, that I want to make. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of word processors, and if you want to get really archaic, the first word processor that I ever saw, and this is going to make me sound kind of old, was a linotype machine. Linotype machine, you'd hit a key, it'd go up into this great big machine, it would find a metal ingot that had the letter, and that would come flying down the tracks, and they'd put some ink on it and hit the paper. It was very slow, it was very expensive, it was very noisy. Um, and also, you had to make all your mistakes on the paper before you could go back and correct them, and that was very difficult. Then we went into kind of the stage of the IBM Selectric, I guess the era of the IBM Selectric. Some of you may still have been in that recently. And the exciting thing about the IBM Selectric was for the first time you could hit a key like an L and you could get something different than the last time you hit the key by changing the little element in your typewriter. For the first time we could get bold, we could get italics, we could change type fonts and, and get Bodini or, or some other type font. And that was exciting. We used to line all the little elements up. But we were still forced to make the errors on the page before or we had to print it, we had to make the errors on the page before we could make the correction. And you may remember some of the ways that we used to make corrections. I don't know if you're old enough to remember the little white pieces of paper that we used to string all over our desk and cram those down in the typewriter and try and get the letter to hit right where it hit before to correct it. Then we went into a great era after that, a nice new product. In fact, the singing group, the Monkees, went around here not too long ago. You may have noticed there were only three of them instead of four. Michael Nesmith was the fourth member, and he did not tour. The reason he did not tour is that his mother invented Whiteout, and he inherited about $43 million and didn't need to sing anymore. It wasn't Whiteout a great invention. In fact, I remember just sitting back with that and just painting all over our page, and we get these big lumps where the Whiteout got a little too heavy. But for those of us that had to do legal documents or contracts, we couldn't go through and, and white out our mistakes. And so then the real word processing came along. And the reason I go through all this is, is to drive home the point that the word processor allows us to make all of our errors on the screen before we put them on the page. And I still know a lot of people who, using a word processing program, Word or, or anyone, they'll go through, do their entire document, print out a copy, and then sit down and start correcting all their errors. If you're going to do that, then you might as well use a typewriter because you've got a very expensive typewriter sitting here. So the first step to using a word processing program, anyone, is to plan out in advance what you want your document to look like. Take a minute, take a piece of paper and a pencil and just simply sketch out what you'd like it to look like when it's finished. Are you going to have headlines? Are you going to have footnotes? Are you going to have headers or footers? Are you going to have one column or two or three? And you will save a tremendous amount of time when you sit down with your program to make that document on the screen look like you want it to look like when it's printed. Second area is go through all the different regimens that we have to make corrections before you print it out. So now we're here with the, the Apple Macintosh, and we've got a brand new program, Word 4.0. 
It's got a lot of nice new features, and we want to go through some of those today. Before I go right into that, let me just go through some definitions, because I want to make sure that I don't use any words in this tutorial that you perhaps are not familiar with. So let me go through each of these definitions very quickly. First of all, when you measure type, when you measure copy, and you're seeing how wide it is, you'll have options as to how to measure that. One option that a lot of printers like to use, a lot of photo typesetters like to use, and a lot of the new programs are allowing you to use is a measurement called picas, P-I-C-A-S. A pica, there are six picas per inch. So all you need to do is measure your copy in inches, divide it by six, and that'll tell you how many picas wide the width of your copy is. And the next thing we like to measure one. is the height of our copy. How tall is it from the very top of the tallest letter all the way down to the bottom of the lowest ascender that we have in our copy? And that is measured in points, P-O-I-N-T-S points and you'll notice that Microsoft Word gives you the option of choosing how many points or how high you would like your letters. Best way to remember that is that there are 72 points in an inch. So if you select 72 points for your copy you will get letters that are one inch tall. If you choose 36 point they'll be half inch tall and 18 point quarter inch tall. Is there any copy that's uh, larger than 72 point? Yes, there is. Uh, the days that I worked at the newspaper, we had 344 point type, I remember. Mm -hmm. We used to call that second coming type. I guess that's the time that we were going to use that. And you'll notice that sometimes when you get very large copy, it'll look really good when it's printed. And sometimes when you go up in size, up to 72 or 90 point type, it won't look very good. And there's a reason for that. And we'll be, I'll be explaining to you how to uh, make your copy always look good, no matter what size you go up in. So that's points. A couple other terms, default. We're going to talk about the default setting on the computer. Default simply means that the computer has a lot of settings built in. If you open up Word, most likely it will start in Geneva. It might start in 10 point or 12 point. All of those are default settings. It's already set your margins at zero and six inches. Um, it has set your top margin at, at one inch, your bottom margin at one inch, a half inch on either side. Those are all default settings, and you can change those. And we'll go into how to change each of those default settings later on in the tape. Next term is word wrapping. Word wrapping simply means that when you get to the end of a line of type in Word, it will automatically go to the next line without you hitting a carriage return. I'm sure you're familiar with this if you've used a word processor. The only reason I bring this point up here is that in Microsoft Word, if you do a carriage return, if you reach down and hit the return on your keyboard, you automatically tell Word this is a brand new paragraph even if it isn't a new paragraph. So remember, whenever you do a manual carriage return, you're telling the machine, you're telling the program, this is a new paragraph. Next term, reverse type. Reverse type simply means white letters on a black back background versus black letters on a white background. Uh, we use this a lot to draw attention to a certain copy block. There's a few rules when using a page maker, for example, allows you to do reverse type. There's a few rules when using reverse type. First of all, never use it smaller than 18 point. Also, never put it in long copy blocks. And the reason is, is it's, it's very difficult to read. I have found that it's best to use reverse type in a, in a headline or perhaps a, a price that is very large, one block that'll say $49 or $249. Reverse type shows up and stands out very much in when you use it in, in that way. I love it. Okay, uh, the last thing that I'd like to mention Actually, the last two items as far as definitions. One is letting, L-E-A-D-I-N-G, and this comes back from the good old line of type days. When they wanted to separate a line of copy from another line of copy, they used to put a little strip of, of lead in between those two. Letting is simply the spacing in between your lines. And a lot of the new programs, including Word, will allow you now to adjust that space, and that is called adjusting the letting. In PageMaker, for example, you can set that. You can have 10-point type on 11-point letting, which will give you one point of space in between the two lines. So uh, that is another term. The last term is font, type font. Now, in Microsoft Word, you are allowed to set the font that you want to use. And, and again, if we're going to use the Macintosh, let's use it to its, its fullest capacity. A Macintosh will, computer will do basically 80% of what a $40,000 photo typesetting machine will do. And mainly what that does is allow you to select your type fonts, your type styles, and your type sizes. It allows you to create any look that you would like with your copy. So type font is very important. Now type font, as I mentioned, is a type style. If I had you sit down and write out a line of copy with handwritten, yours would be a little different than mine. It'd be the same letters, the same words, but a little different style. 
Right now there are over 5,000 type fonts available for the Macintosh computer. Uh, they are, your computer will hold without changing some of your software up to 200 of these type fonts. In my computer I have 131. Of that 131, I basically use two. I think the other 129 are there to impress people at Mac Academies. But you will find that you can put an incredible amount of fonts into your computer, as I mentioned, up to 200. So of all these 5,000 type fonts that are available out there, you can put those into three categories. There are three basic categories of type font. The first is called cursive or script. Now what that basically means is the type font that looks like calligraphy or it looks like it was handwritten. Um, Venice is the one that most of you have in your computer that's already built in. A few rules when using a cursive or script font. First of all, again, never use it smaller than 18 point. Don't use it in, in long copy blocks. Try not to ever make it bold or to italicize it or to underline it. And especially, don't ever use it in all caps. Um, in fact, a general rule in all typography is to stay away from all caps. It's very difficult to read. Well, with cursive no. or script type, it is okay, especially difficult to read. to read. In fact, if you have seen some of the different uh, uppercase uh, letters in some of your different fonts, you might not even be able to recognize it. It almost looks like an oriental figure. So use those rules when using a cursive or a script type. The other two types of type font, there, are, there is serif and sans serif. Now, serif is the little line, the little extra line on the end of each of the letters. All the typography classes that I've attended and the studies I've seen shows that uh, serif type is easier to read than sans serif type. Now, basically, the reason we're sitting down at our computer is to make it so someone else will read it, and so it'll be easy to read. So I have found that serif type is a little more formal looking, and it is also easier to read. You will also find that it looks more like a typewriter type face. And I find it kind of ironic. Here we all had typewriters, and we threw the typewriters away, and we all went out and spent thousands of dollars on a computer. And then we try very hard to make our document look like it came off a typewriter. Well, I have found that the most popular type fonts are the ones that, that look like a typewriter. It's, it's a more personal look. Uh, let me just suggest a few type fonts to you. If you are using a laser printer, if you have a laser printer, I would suggest Times. Times is an excellent type font. It uh, is a serif type, which means it's easier to read. It looks like it came off a typewriter, and it is also very condensed, which means you can get a lot of letters in a very small amount of space. If you are uh, not using a laser printer, I would suggest Geneva, Boston, or New York. Again, they fit that criteria. They are serif types. They look like they came off a typewriter. They're not quite as condensed as Times is, but they are excellent. You will find them in a lot of textbooks. A lot of newspapers use that type font. If uh, you would like a sans serif type font, a Helvetic is the one that I would suggest. It is a very clean type font. It takes up a lot of space. In fact, I found a lot of textbooks use Helvetic, and I think it's because you can make a very small article look very long. Um, a lot of people use that, and you'll find that in newspapers also. So Helvetic is an excellent type font. Uh, many of you may have the experience of choosing a new type font on the Macintosh computer. And it looks great on the screen, and you go to print it out either on your laser writer or on your image writer. And for one of those two printers, it doesn't look very good. It'll look great on one of them, and then you'll go to the laser printer, and it won't look good or vice versa. Let me give you a little rule of thumb when choosing your typefaces so that you know which one will look good on a laser printer and which one will look good on an image writer. You'll notice that most of the type fonts are named after cities. Boston, New York, Geneva, Stuttgart. Uh, the basic rule of thumb, there are some exceptions, but basically if it is named after a city, it will look good on your image writer printer. If it is not named after a city, it is most likely a postscript font, or it was designed to look good on a laser printer. So all of your couriers, times, avant-garde, zap, ding, bap, all of those different chubby, teeny, tiny, each of those uh, different type fonts were designed to be run on a laser printer. So again, rule of thumb, if it's named after a city, look good on your image writer. If it's not named after a city, it is most likely a postscript font or a laser font, and it'll look good on your laser printer. Okay, those are just some general terms, some general rules, some, uh, some like, kind of general guys rules don't of thumb, believe me, like, and this will help you a lot when like, planning your document. Don't believe him, now it's time that checks. we uh, turn to the computer. He doesn't. So what oh I have God, done is I've already remember. opened up a document in oh, Microsoft God. Word. 4.0. You'll see it's called Randy's Ready Reference. Uh, all you do is double cl click on the application and uh, you will get a blank piece of paper or if you have already done a document as I have here, all you need to do is double click and that will launch that uh, application 
and you'll be able to start working in that. So here we go. As you can see, this is a regular letter in Word. And I'm going to go through some of the pull-down menus. The way to remember a pull-down menu is to kind of think back of the old blinds like you your know, grandmother had. You used to reach up in the window and you'd That's pull that blind down. That's good. The exciting thing about the Macintosh and Microsoft is that as you pull down each of these menus, most of the words are in English. You'll, recommend, That's you'll great. recognize I them. Speak They're not English. some computer, computer command. And I'm not going to go through each of the pull-down menus right now because we'll be using them in the next couple of hours. But I would like to spend a minute on the file menu. As I pull down the file menu, you'll notice some words Wait, that you'll recognize. There's new, open, close, save, save as, delete, on think, down okay, to quit. Uh, you'll also notice opposite no, some of the commands, there will be a little symbol that looks like a four-leaf clover and a letter. What this allows you to do is Microsoft said anytime you want to do a command, you have one of two choices. You can either use the mouse and pull down the menu and select one of the commands, or you can simply use the keyboard. So whenever over to the right you see the little you command like symbol and a letter, yeah. that means if you hit command N, it dogs. will do the same thing as selecting new. Command O opens a document. I don't like my dog. Now new and open simply means new says I'd like a brand new piece of paper that I've never written on or never given a name to. Open says I would like to open a document that I have already named that I've already used, which is what I have done here. Close closes the piece of paper, or if you're thinking of your desktop as a real desktop, all that simply means is I'm taking this current piece of paper no, off of my desk. Right now, but no, all right, now the next two items on here, save and save as, I'd like to talk about just for a moment. I don't think that there is a worse feeling that anyone has ever had working on a computer than when they have just been typing for three or four hours. They've been doing probably their best work. I mean, this is their greatest hits. And you've been sitting here and you've been typing away and the creative juices are flowing. And all of a sudden, the lights get a little bright and then they dim and you hear an ominous ding. And you look down and on your screen is a little box. Now, down in the bottom of the lower left-hand corner of the box, you'll find a, a bomb. A little picture of a bomb. It's kind of like Spy versus Spy back in the old Mad Magazines. And off you. to the right of the bomb is probably the greatest well, understatement that's ever been written that. in computerdom. And what it basically yeah, says is, sorry, a system creepy. error has occurred. Now, I don't I think there's a person that's ever used a computer, an IBM or a Macintosh or whatever, when experiencing a system error that doesn't think exactly the same thing. And that is, I hope... I have not lost my document. That's what I'd I like hope. to point something out on the computer here, and that is as I pull down this file menu, you will notice that the word hope does not appear. You will also notice that there is no such thing as command M for miracle. The document, all the computer, I guess, uh, fools you a little bit, and that is as you're typing along and you see all the different words on the screen, you think it's remembering it, and it isn't remembering anything. Remember that the computer will only save a document when you tell it to save that document. As far as when, as the letters that are on your document, it, if you ever need to tell it to save a document, you have to give the computer that command. You'll notice under file that there are two save commands, save and save as. Now the rule of thumb is, is that you should save every screen load. Every time you've got a new screen load of copy, you should save your document. Now to save your document, you simply come down and select save. Or if you like to use your keyboard, simply hit command S. Now as I say that, I know you sitting out there watching, you're not going to do that because nobody does. So I'd like to leave one last hint, I guess, when it comes to saving a document, and that is in the four years I've used this computer, I have found that 90% of all of the bombs will occur when you go to print your document. And when you think about it, that's the worst possible time it could occur because you're all done. So I please get into the habit of before you hit Command P to print your document or before you go up under File and go down and select Print, always save your document. I use at least if you do that, that you'll write me letters of great time, thanks so because now if the dog runs under the table and grabs the cord and heads out in the backyard, when you turn your computer back on, it'll still be saved. Mm -hmm. Now, as we go down, the other one is Save As. Save As is a command that allows you to create what is called templates. Now, many of you would like to, uh, for example, create a customer service letter. And let's say the first three paragraphs are always exactly the same. But you always have to add a fourth paragraph down at the bottom of your document. And it gets a little tiresome typing out the first three paragraphs over and over again. 
What Save As allows you to do is to create a document that has the first three paragraphs. Then, when you want to open that document up and make a change, simply open that document and call it your customer service letter. Make the changes you want to make, add the paragraph that you'd like to add, and then, instead of going to Save, go to Save As. And as you go down to Save As and select yeah, that, a little box will appear way. on the screen and say, what would you like to name this document? At that point, give it a new name, and when you close, you'll find that you have your original document, your customer service document, and you'll have your brand new one also. So that allows you not to have to go back in and recreate the original document. Simply make changes, make additions, and then save that document. Now be sure and always give it a, another name, a different name, a unique name, and the one that you've opened up. If you give it the same name, then what will happen is that it will replace your original document and you'll only have the document remaining that has the changes. Okay, now we're going to get into Microsoft Word. Let me just mention that there are seven functions I'm going to teach you today. Uh, in the advanced tape or on the advanced tape, or if you go to Mac Academy in the advanced class, you'll learn how to do side-by-side -side paragraphs. You'll learn how to do... Um, headers and footers and you'll learn how to do style sheets and automatic outlining and all of those are nice features but realistically 99% of the time that you spend on your computer you will only do seven functions and that's what I'm going to teach you in this class. So those are the seven that we're going to go through here today. And I've learned something about uh, Microsoft software and about uh, Macintosh software. And that is 20% of the features that are on there are so easy that you can pop them into the computer and figure them out. In fact, the biggest advantage to the Apple Macintosh is you don't need to read the manuals to use it. You'll also find that the biggest disadvantage to the Macintosh computer is that you don't need to read the manuals to use it. And so we pop our disk in there and we learn 20% of it and we never learn the other advanced features that the program has. So the 20% you can figure out by yourself. 20% of it you'll probably never use. We are becoming very feature laden. In fact, someone, some people call it featureitis in some of the new programs. And there are things that'll do that you'll never want to do. So it's the other 60% that we're going to focus on today. So let's go through those seven features, seven functions in Microsoft Word. The first one is called selecting. Selecting. Now, we used to call this highlighting, but now some of the new programs have a function called highlighting also. So we'll call it selecting, which simply means telling the computer, this is what I want to work on. So let's go through the selecting features of Microsoft Word. First of all, to select a letter. To select a letter, you simply click and drag. Now, your mouse only does three things. It clicks, it double clicks, and it clicks and drags, which means clicking the mouse down and dragging it over something. So to select a letter, we click and drag over the letter. Next is to select an entire word. Now we can do it the slow way, and that is we can click in front of the first letter and drag over each letter, or you can do it the quick way, and that is to double click on the word. You can double click on any word that you'd like and select that word. Now the next selection technique is selecting an entire line. Now for some of you that have used Microsoft Works or McWrite, you might be familiar with some of these selecting techniques. This one gets a little unusual because it uses the selection bar. The only thing unusual about the selection bar is you can't see it. So I want you to watch the eye beam Watch the little point where right now that the mouse is. And as it goes to the left, you will notice that the eye beam turns into an arrow. Notice as it goes to the left, it turns into an arrow. When it turns into an arrow, you are in the selection bar. So to select a line, okay. simply go over to the left of the line in the selection bar and click once. To select an entire line of copy, go to the selection bar and click once, and it will select the entire line. Now, to select an entire paragraph, we also use the selection bar. Simply go over to the paragraph and double-click in the selection bar, and it will select the entire paragraph. So a quick review. To select a letter, click and drag over the letter. To select a word, double-click on the word. To select a line, single-click in the selection bar. To select a paragraph, double-click in, in the selection bar. All right, now the next one is to select multiple paragraphs. Now you may have noticed that I just used the scrolling bar over here to the side. If you need to go up in your document or down in your document, you simply click on the arrows, and each click will take you down one line at a time. If you're in a big hurry, you can actually grab the little elevator in the shaft, and you can move it around in your document. Now, this is very common in all of the different Microsoft and, Macro and uh, Macintosh programs. Okay, to select more than one paragraph, simply go over to the selection bar, double-click to select the first paragraph, 
Keep holding the mouse down, and as you drag it to the bottom, you will notice it will select every paragraph, one paragraph at a time. So to select more than one paragraph, go over to the left, double click, and drag the mouse down, and it will select every paragraph, one paragraph at a time. Now the next selection technique is to select your entire document. Now this comes in really handy if you have typed about 17 pages and you want to suddenly double space instead of single space and you need to select your entire document. To do that, go anywhere in your document. It can be the beginning or in the middle or the end. Simply hold your command key down and click once. If you hold the command key down, now the command key is two keys to the left of your space bar. If you hold the command key down and click once, it will select your entire document. Now as you scroll through your document, you will notice that it's all selected. That one comes in really handy. Now the next one is, is not used a lot, but does come in handy, and that is how to select an odd grouping of words. Let's say, for example, that you would like to select five words, or you'd like to select a paragraph and a half, or a page and a half. The way to do that is to simply click where you would like the selection to start. Now in this case, I want it to start right before the word I, and then go down and click where you want it to stop. But if I clicked right now, it would just simply move the cursor to that point, so I have to do something else. So, to make that selection, simply click where you want it to start, go down to where you want it to stop, and hold your shift key down as you make the second click, and you will notice it selects everything in between those two spots. So once again, click where you want it to start, and go down to where you want your selection to stop, hold the shift key down, and click the second time, and it will click in between those two spots. You find that that comes in really handy when you want to select uh, something like a page and a half. You simply click where you want it to start and then you scroll the through pages, to the second like page. On, on like and as the, you get to the point where you want it to stop, then you can hold the shift key down and click and it will select everything in between those two points. Okay, that's selecting. Now everything else that I'm going to teach you in this two hour tape is based on selecting. You've always got to select first and tell the computer this is what I'd like to have you work on. Okay, the next function is called deleting. I want to take something out of my document and it is extremely simple. Deleting is simply select and then hit your backspace key. On some of your computers, it says backspace on your key. It's up in the upper right-hand corner. Some of them, it says delete, same key. All right, so right here, we've got Word Workshop. If I would like to get rid of the Word Workshop, I simply select it and hit my backspace key. Yeah. Select, backspace key. If I wanted to get rid of my entire document right now, all I'd have to do is select the entire document, hit my backspace key, and it would all be gone. Now, for example, if I would like to delete this paragraph, I simply select it and hit my backspace key. Now, sooner or later, you're going to be using the Macintosh, and you're going to do that, and then you're going to wish you didn't do that. It's called repentance, I guess. And uh, they knew that was going to happen, and so they put in a nice little feature. And you'll notice I just deleted my first paragraph, and all of a sudden I decided I really didn't want to do that. If you will go up under the Edit menu, you will find a nice little command called Undo. Now, if I select Undo, you will notice that my... Uh, my paragraph comes back. The undo feature. Now I've decided that what I need in life is an undo button. Whenever I do anything really dumb, I simply push undo and uh, start over again. Well, it works on the Macintosh, but it doesn't work in life. <laughs> uh, let me just tell you something about the undo button, and that is it will only remember the last function that you did. You cannot go back and say, oh remember that God, uh, paragraph I deleted about six minutes ago? It He's only having, remembers the likes last likes function likes that you did, and it will allow you to bring that back. So that's the undo feature. That's deleting in Microsoft Word. Now, the next thing that you're going to want to do is insert, inserting. Now, what that means is I want to put copy into my document, or I want to type some copy. And again, it is extremely easy. It is simply okay. click and type. So right now, if I want to put the word workshop into my document, I simply type, click where I want it to go, and type it in. Now, of course, the nice thing about word processing is that I could type in 29 pages at this point, and it would just keep scrolling my document down and adding all the copy. All right, so we've gone through deleting, we've gone through inserting. Now, I want to combine those two into the next function, and that is deleting and inserting at the same time. You're going to want to do that a lot because that's how you correct copy. For example, if you put in an O and it should have been an I, you're going to want to take the O I. O out and put the I in. So let's go through deleting and inserting. Now, you, two ways you could do it. You could do it the long way, and that is you could highlight what you don't want and push the delete key, and then you could type in what you do want, as I just showed you. Now, that's kind of a long way to do it. Microsoft Word allows you to do both of them with one function, and that is simply highlight what you don't want 
to type in what you do want. So uh, remember As to you know, delete and insert at the uh, same time. Is, highlight ending, what it is no or select what it is that you do not so want and simply type now. in I'll what you do want. You highlight what you don't want, type in what you do want. So oh, if it's just one letter you want to change an O, for example, to an I, simply highlight it and type in what you want. If you're trying to change that from the I to the O, which is what it should be. Select it and then type in the new letter. All right. Now, the next thing that we want to do once we have deleted and we have inserted and we have highlighted is that we are going to want to move copy around in our document. And uh, if you'll remember, if any of you have ever used a, an IBM or one of those programs, WordStar WordPerfect, I remember that was very difficult to move copy around. Well, you will find that it is extremely simple in Microsoft Word because it uses cut and paste. Now, let me just talk to you for just a moment without using perhaps the, the computer here. I have a, I've found that the, the Macintosh computer is an icon-driven machine. What that basically means is it works in pictures. Now, I've found working over the last few years, there are two kinds of people. people there are some people that think in pictures, and there are others that think in numbers or, or words. Well, Macintosh thinks in pictures. And I have found that if you'll ever remember why something does something or how it does it, it isn't as important that you remember exactly what buttons to push or what words to find in the pull-down menu if you remember how it's working. So we're going to be using cut and paste. And I, I've got a little way of remembering cut and paste. If you'll think back to the days of, of when you were in kindergarten, they used to give you a pair of scissors. Now, in our class, they, they had blunted ends so we wouldn't stab each other. <laughs> and then they gave us a bottle of paste, which we ate. Uh, in fact, I found I had high cholesterol the other day, and, and it's probably all that paste rolling around in there. But if you remember what you did, you used to take the scissors, and you would cut around the picture, and you'd cut it out, and then you'd take some paste, and you'd stick it on the back of the picture, and you would put it where you wanted it. That's exactly how cut and paste no, works on the Apple Macintosh computer, case. cutting and pasting. So let's do that in our document now. What we want to yeah, do is we want to move the first paragraph picture. somewhere else in our in our document. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to highlight it, or select it, excuse me. Then we'll go up under Edit, and you'll come down, and again, remember the pair of scissors, we cut it out. We just selected Cut out of the Edit menu, and you'll notice it disappeared. Now all you have to do is go down into your document where you would like it to appear, select a point, where, an insertion point, now go back up to Edit, and again, remember Kindergarten, we simply paste it in, and there it is. You cut it out, and then you paste it where you want it. Now, let me just ask you a question, and I hope if you've been following along. Since it simply disappeared, where did it go? Well, the Macintosh has two storage areas. There are two storage areas in the Macintosh computer. One is long-term, one is short-term. Now, one of them is RAM and one of them is ROM, but don't remember that. It doesn't have to be that technical. You have a scrapbook under the Apple menu. That's your long-term. What that means is if you cut something out and paste it into the scrapbook, it will be there when you turn your computer off and turn it back on. You have another storage area, and it's really just a holding area, and it's called the clipboard. You never see it, but it's a little tiny storage area that when you have taken something, you just want it held for a few minutes, and you're going to be doing something with it, it goes to the clipboard. Cut and paste utilizes the clipboard. So what that means is when I cut that paragraph out, it went to the clipboard until I told it where to paste it. Now again, remember, the clipboard will only hold one thing at a time, and it will only hold the last item that you put on it. As a matter of fact, when you use undo, that's where it goes. And so if you ever put something on the clipboard, you turn your computer off, when you turn it back on, it will not be there anymore. So that's how cut and paste works. All right, let's go back down into the program now. Yeah, so we've gone through three of the functions. Now the next one that if we want to like go through, and this is one of the ones play, that uh, you'll like probably be using the most, is style, style changes. I want to change the finish. look of my copy. I want it to look differently. Now, the first thing that most people want to do is they want to take a word, a headline, and they want to make it bold, or they would like to uh, italicize it, or they'd like to underline it. Now, there are actually three ways to do this That's in Microsoft Word, so let's go through one of the ways, first of all, and that is under Format. Now, you'll notice I highlighted whatever it was I wanted to change. I now go under Format, and down here on the bottom, you will notice the commands, Bold. So if I select that, my word is now bold. If I come down under Italic, you'll notice it is now italicized. If I come down and select Underline, it is now underlined. Now, also, if I decide I do not want any of those style changes, 
I go back under format and I come down and deselect bold. Now if you will think about those selections as toggle switches, they're either turned on or they're off. So right now, if I want to go down italic, as you can see the little check mark says it's turned on. I can deselect that. And now I can come down and deselect underline. Now if some of you have been using Microsoft Word for a while and you've made some items, words in your document bold or underlined them and later went and changed those, and all of a sudden you went to type, and you noticed that um, you, all of a sudden you were typing in a new typeface or a new size, I can tell you what the reason for that is and how to keep that from happening. A lot of times what happened is somebody went down and made a word bold, then they went down and, and underlined it. A little later you changed your mind, and some of you figured out that if you come down and select plain text, it will take them away those commands all at once. It was kind of a little shortcut. Well, the problem with that is plain text also it's takes away any other commands then, that you've given your document. So if you started up in Geneva and you've changed to times, if you started in 10 point and you've gone to 12, and you go down and select plain text, it erases all those commands. So the key to making sure that uh, you stay in the same typeface and style that you're in is simply go down and deselect bold and come down and deselect underline if you do not wish those commands to be there. Okay, that's one way to do it. Now there's a little shortcut that I'd like to give all of you right now, and actually these shortcuts work in almost all of the Macintosh applications, and it'll save you a great deal of time. Now, if you will remember that what you're going to do on all of these commands is you're going to press two keys at once, and they are your command key and your shift key. Now, in the old version 3.02, it didn't tell you about these on your pull-down menu. Now, under format, you'll even find that it shows you these commands. They are key, key command equivalents of what we've just been doing. So, you're going to start all these commands by holding two keys down, your command key and your shift key. Now, your shift key is, is the uppercase key, or to make all your letters uppercase. All right, so right now, if we want to make the word workshop bold, we hold down command, shift, B, and you'll notice it went bold. So, command, shift, B, makes your work bold. Command, shift, I, will italicize it. Command shift U underlines your change. word. No, so no, notice I haven't even no, used the mouse at all. I haven't moved it around at all. Monday, I've just used my Monday. keyboard. Now again, I can also deselect or turn the toggle switch off by doing the same commands. Command shift I takes away the italics. Command shift U takes away the underline. Command shift B takes away the bold. So you will find that as a shortcut, and as I said, that works in a lot of your uh, other programs, your other Macintosh programs. Now, there's one other shortcut using these same commands that will save you more time. Um, I used to get so frustrated when I try and decide the size I wanted my copy. I'd go up and I'd choose 9 point and it'd be too small, and then I'd choose 36 point and it'd be too large, and then I'd choose 18 point and it'd be too small, and I'd go back and forth and waste a lot of time. And I used to wish, wouldn't it be nice if you could look at the word workshop there and say, what would that look like one size bigger? What would it like, look like another size bigger and another size bigger? No, that's too big. I'd like to go smaller, smaller, smaller. Well, uh, that is now available. So let me tell you how to do that. If you want to make something larger and see how it would look in a larger size, hit simply hold down your command key, your shift key, and then remember back to arithmetic and some of your algebra and hit the greater than key. Now, if you don't remember the symbol of the greater than, it looks like a V laying on its side. Greater than is over is on the same button as your period, and the less than key is on the same button as your comma key. So if I want to make my words larger, I hit command shift greater than. If I want it larger again, command shift greater than. Now if I want to go down in size, command shift less than, command shift less than, command shift less than. I think you'll find that as a great shortcut. That has saved me literal hours on the computer by using that in Word and other programs. So again, Command Shift less than takes it down sizes. Command Shift um, greater than will take it up. All right. So that's the second way that you can do the size, and uh, or first way with it that you can do the size. The second way to do the size is to pull down your font menu. Yeah, font. Now under font, you will notice all your sizes. We have, if you want to make it 12 point, select 12 point. If you'd like to go up to 24 point, you can go up to 24 point, all the way down to 9 point. By the way, 9 point has a special use, and that's for real estate contracts. Okay, so we go back up 12 point, all the way back up to 18 point. Now, at, by pulling down the font menu, you can also change the type font. Now, in the old Microsoft 3.02, it only listed a few type fonts here, and you had to go under the character 
dialog box to get yeah, all of the choices of all the program or all of the fonts that are in your computer. Now you will find there's only it looks like eight or nine here in this computer, but if I had a hundred in here, it will simply scroll down. You'll also notice that they have changed position. The points used to be down the bottom and the font used to be on top, and those are now in different positions. So if I want to change my type font, I've still got workshop highlighted. Then I select Boston. There's what Boston looks like. If I want to select Helvetica, there's Helvetica. And on down the line, there's Times, which is what we started in. So for a quick way to change size or to change font, simply select what it is you'd like to change. Go up under Font and select the size and the type font that you want. I'd like you to notice something at this point. I'd like you to notice the sizes, 9, 10, 12. All of them are outlined. Let me show you what I mean by outlined. If I select Boston, for example, you'll notice now that 12 is outlined, but 9, 10, 14, 18, 24 are all solid. If I come down here and select Venice, then you'll notice that 12 and 14 and 24 are outlined, and the others are solid. Now, those are done for a reason. Let me just explain this for a minute. When they created the Apple Macintosh computer, they realized that there were really roughly 250 spots in there for fonts. Apple themselves used 50 of those, and so it left you with roughly 200. The problem is, is that every font in every size is seen by the computer as a separate font. What that means is times 10 is one font, times 12 is another, uh, actually times bold is another, and so they quickly ran out of room. So what Apple decided to do was what we're going to do is we're only going to install certain sizes of each font into the computer. Now, without getting too technical, and I don't want to lose anybody out there, but right, basically right, right. what that says right. is some of the sizes are installed in the computer, and others, the computer has to make a version of that size. What does that mean to you? That simply means that some sizes are going to look better when they're printed than other sizes. So, to allow you to know the difference, what they have done is they have outlined the installed sizes, and they have put the sizes that are not installed in solid black. Now again, what does that mean to you? Simply this. The sizes that are black aren't going to look as good as the outline sizes. So if you're always trying to make your copy look good, always select the outline sizes. Now I use times all the time, so I installed every size in times. Geneva or um, some of the others, Venice, I hardly ever use, and so there's only a few sizes installed. Now that also is going to come in handy in a few minutes. All right, so that's the way that you can change very quickly both your sizes and your fonts. Now, there's another way that allows you a few more options and is a little slower, and that is if you'll go under Format and select Character. Now, this opens up your Character dialog box, and for some of you that have not used 4.0 before, you'll notice it looks a little different. First of all, all your fonts now are in what is called a drop-down menu, and if I click on the little arrow, there they all are, hidden under Font. If I want the sizes, I simply click on the arrow. Now, it will only show you, when you're in the Character dialog box, the installed sizes. Those are the only ones that will show up. All of those sizes that were black under the font will not show up. And you'll notice now you have options of color. You've got black, blue, green, magenta, all the different colors. And you can simply select each one of those. If you've got a color monitor, they'll show up in the different colors. If you've got a color printer, then this allows you to print out each of your different plates. You can print out a black plate and a blue plate and, and whatever. All right, and you'll notice all of your different options. You've got a lot of underline options now, your superscript, subscript, and also, as I was mentioning before, you have got even some uh, spacing options now, which we'll go into later on. Right now, the only other thing I wanted to point out here is what if you want a size of copy that is larger than the options that it gave you? I think ours went up to 24 at that point. What would happen if I wanted a 119-point type? Well, all you do is come up here to the size box and type in whatever size you'd like. Now, here I type in 119. If I put on OK, then the computer will basically break its rear end trying to come up with a 119-point type. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the tape that sometimes when you go up in size, it'll look really nice when it's printed, and sometimes it won't. What is the secret to that? The secret to that are those outline sizes. So here's a little rule to remember. Whenever you're going up in size and typing in sizes that are larger than the ones given, always go up in multiples of the outline sizes. Always go up in multiples of the installed sizes. Now, if you'll remember, 12 was installed in one of the fonts we were looking at. So if you were going to go up in size in that font, go to 12, 24, 36, 48, 60, 
72. Don't go to 31 or 35 or 59 because, again, the computer will have to make a version of that and it won't look good when it's printed. So if you want larger sizes, just think about it. Find one of the installed sizes that's outlined, double it, triple it, quadruple it, and it'll always look as good as the smaller size. Okay, we don't want to keep with 119 points, so let's go back to uh, 24 point and say OK. And now when we go back to our document, there we are at 24 point. Okay, so that is how you change the sizes and the styles and the fonts in Microsoft Word. And as you'll notice, you've got a lot of options. There's a lot of quick ways to do it. There are a lot of, of uh, longer ways that give you more options. Now, we have spent about a third of the tape so far going through the preliminary parts and through basically the first five techniques that you learn, need to learn how to use. And that means that we've only got two left, and obviously we don't have a great deal of time, or we've got a lot of time left on the tape, and so they must be a little harder, and they are. And that is utilizing the ruler in Microsoft Word. Now, a lot of you that have used Microsoft Works or have used MacWrite know about a ruler. But in those programs, you went up and you got the ruler, and you went down and you put it into your copy. You literally put it up above the paragraph. You got into Word, and all of a sudden the ruler looked the same, but when you went to use it, then suddenly you couldn't move it, and uh, you lost the security of having it right above the paragraph. And so one of the most confusing parts, I guess, to switching to Microsoft Word is using the ruler. So let's go through that right now, and let me just give you a golden rule to using the ruler in Microsoft Word, and that is simply this. The ruler will command whatever you select in your document or whatever you're going to type. Now let me say that again. You're going to bring down a ruler and we're going to make some changes. And you're going to wonder, will that change my entire document? Will it change what I'm going to type? Just remember that any changes we make in the ruler will only affect if your document's already open. If you do not select anything in the document, it won't change anything. If you select a paragraph, which is what we're going to do here in a minute, and you make a change in the ruler, it will change that paragraph only. So again, the rule is the ruler will command whatever you're going to type or whatever you select in your current document. And I think that'll make a little more sense here in a minute. So let's go back to the computer here and let's bring out our ruler. Now the ruler can be found. You can either hit your command key and I, I R or you can go up to show ruler. And there is the ruler. And it'll look familiar to most of you. So let's go through all the options in the ruler. First of all, you'll notice some little boxes under the three inch mark. Three to four inch, there are four boxes. One, two, three, and four. Those are your justification boxes. Justification. So let's change the justification of this paragraph. Now again, I select it because the ruler will only command or make changes in what I select or what I'm going to type. Right now, you'll notice that the first box is already selected. That's the default selecting. That, that is justified left, flush left. So you'll notice if you never make any changes, every time you type, it will be flush left. The second option or the second box is centered. And you'll notice that centers my paragraph. You'll also notice that uh, paragraphs don't look too good centered. The, th the third option is flush right. And the fourth option is justified left and right. Now let me just mention something about justifying both left and right. You'll notice it looks really nice. We've got a nice straight left edge and we've got a nice straight right edge. But you'll also notice whenever you use this option that you'll get some strange spacing in your document. Some words will have one space between them, some will have two, some might even have three. So this is a nice little option. It does make it look good. But remember, you give something up when it looks really strange is if you only got three words in your sentence. It'll stick one way over to the left. It'll stick one way over to the right. And it'll leave the third one floating around in the middle somewhere. I found that the key to using this is uh, very narrow uh, columns. There's a lot of space to fill. And it looks really nice, dual justified, if you've got narrow columns. When you get 8.5 by 11, you can really get some strange. Uh, the four options. We can go flush left. We can go centered, we can go flush right, and we can dual justify it both left and right. Now, as I mentioned, paragraphs don't look too good centered. Headlines look great centered. So if I come up to my headline and hit centered, it will center my headline. If I select my subhead and hit center, my subhead, and you'll notice those look very nice. So those are your justifications. Let's go on to the next ones, and we'll use this paragraph. Again, and they're under the four inch mark, and there are three of them one, two, and three single space, double space, and triple space. Now, yeah, if I want to change my spacing, I simply select the second 
box, there's, box, there's, there's triple right. space. Single, double, and same. triple. Find out that this is not really single, double, and it is really space, space and a half, double space. If you ever go to compare it to a typewriter, you'll find out that it is space, space and a half, double spaced. Okay, so that's your spacing options. If you want to change your entire document, simply select your entire document and then hit the one desired. If you want to start a document, just go ahead and select that to begin with, and of course it'll affect whatever you're going to type. The next little option, under the five inch mark, there are two boxes. The one that is already selected and a second one. I have a certain way that I like to type. You'll notice in this document that I single space all of my paragraphs, and then you'll notice I double space in between paragraphs. And uh, view. If you want a double space in between progress, you'd hit your carriage return twice. Well, in Microsoft Word, they've made that a little easier, and that is they put a little box that if you will select, <coughs> excuse me, they will automatically give you two spaces every time you hit a carriage return. So the second box and select it will give you two spaces every time you hit a carriage return, which is normally for most of us um, between paragraphs. Now, now if you, search, you remember a little X sitting over here. The little X cancel all your commands. Man, ruler. Now notice that there is a little scale icon, and we'll be using that in a few minutes. So those are the options between the three and the five inch mark. All right. Now what we want to do is we want to go into margins. We want to set margins. Now setting margins in Microsoft Word is extremely simple, and I found that the best way to remember that is again to remember back a few years and to remember back to the uh, old manual Royal typewriters. We used to have these big, heavy typewriters. We use them for anchors nowadays, but they had the big manual typewriters. <laughs> and to set a margin, you'd go up it's on top of the carriage, margin. and there was a ruler along the carriage. And there was a button up on top of the ruler, and you'd push that button down, and you'd move it over to where you wanted your margin and let go, and that became a hard, fast margin. And then if you started to type, you'd, and you'd just type over the so same good. letter over and over again. Well, Microsoft <laughs> Words is exactly the same. So let's go back here to the computer for a moment. And if you look up on your ruler, there is a little <laughs> diamond-shaped triangle up here. A little triangle, excuse me, up here under the zero, and a little triangle under the six. So and change, and reach over here and click on the right-hand margin and drag on it. Now watch my paragraph. As I drag my margin, you'll notice. changes. Now, so the rest of my documents seem the same margins. So this allows you to set different margins for every paragraph if you'd like. So to set the right-hand margin, simply click and drag. Now, to set the left-hand margin works exactly the same. I simply click and drag, and you'll notice immediately the margin follows whatever setting that I have used. Simply click and drag. Now, if some, of, some of you have a good TV and you can see really well, you'll notice that the, the left-hand margin looks a little different than the right-hand margin. It is actually two triangles, whereas the right-hand margin is one. That allows you to do what is called custom left-hand margins. What that means is the top part of the triangle can be moved independently from the bottom part. Now, again, I find that if you'll remember certain rules, you'll do better on the on the computer, you might want to remember this rule. The top triangle commands the first line of your paragraph. The bottom triangle commands the rest of your paragraph. Top triangle, the first line. Bottom triangle, the rest of your paragraph. What that means is you can Hi, set guys. a different margin so for the first the line of your paragraph. So let's do that. If I reach up here and I grab the first triangle, you'll notice it moves by itself. And if I move it over to here and let go, I get this. I want everybody to look at that paragraph. You'll notice now that my margin for the first line is right there. My margin for the rest of the paragraph is there. Does anybody see a nice use for that? That's your custom left-hand margin. That's your automatic indentation. Now, how have you been indenting? Well, most people reach down, hit their space bar five times. Actually, most people don't. Most people hit their tab key. And they'll notice that the tab key goes over too far. It goes over eight spaces, but most people do it because it's easy. So again, if you want to set your automatic indentation, by the way, two and a half of these little marks over here happens to be five spaces, which is kind of standard. You can set that anywhere you like. If I move it over to here, you can see I can bring that margin or that indentation anywhere that I'd like. All right, so now every time that you do a, a return, you'll automatically, your first uh, line will be indented. 
Now, not only can I move the top part of that triangle to the right, yeah. I can also move it to the, the left. Advantage. This is officially yeah. called a hanging indent, by the way. Sounds like something you get on your foot. <laughs> now, watch what I mean. If I move the entire margin <laughs> over to the left, I can reach up and take the top part of that margin and move it back. Oh, excuse me, we moved it all to the right. Now, I can take the top margin and move it to the left, and I end up with something that looks like that. And you say, well, that's really nice, but why would I ever use it? Some of you that have been trying to do this see an immediate use for it. So again, watch what I've done. I've moved the top line to the left of the rest. When would we use that? Well, let me give you a good example. Let's say right now we were going to do a, a lease for a piece of property. Now let's just pretend right now that we've got the people standing there in front of us and we're over on our Macintosh and we're going to type out the rules to uh, living in our property. So we sit down and we say, the following are the rules for living in my house. Number one, I want you to keep your crummy dog off of my brand new carpet. Carpet. If you don't, I will sh shoot both you and your dumb dog. So there. Okay, then you go down to number two. Okay, now, a lot of you have had the opportunity of printing a document that needs something like this. You've used one, two, three, or four, some nesting, or you've used A, B, C, D, or a lot of you've used bullets. Now, realistically, when you typed your document, is this what you wanted it to look like? It isn't. Uh, what you wanted is you wanted the one and the two to line up nice and even, and then you we're want... Done, guys. We are done. It's, that has been an hour of that. There are still 40 minutes to go on that. I'm not gonna do that. I said one hour. I'm bringing it to you guys. I have been here for an hour. Sitting on my bed recording, bringing you guys this stupid video. So, there. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I've been here for an hour. I'm tired. You know, I'm, I'm not tired. Um, there was, guys. I sat to this boring video for an hour. There. Like. See, guys. You see, guys? Say for an hour. This is from 1989. Bye, everybody. Oh my god, I can't believe I did that. I hope you guys have, have, have a good night. I'll see you guys later. Bye.